Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Impulse Control Experiment. Uh, today is going to be episode 18, and as always, I am grateful for you joining me. Um, today, I'm really excited to have our first guest here on the Impulse Control Experiment. Uh, this is my good buddy, the always positive, constant reframer, Nicholas Spohn. Hey, Nick, how you doing? Great. I didn't know I was your first guest. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I have a few other guests lined up, people I've talked to, but you're the first one. Awesome. So, Joel, give me an update. What's going on? How you feeling, brother? Um, it's, been, it's been a month so far, but I'm feeling uh, really good. So, as much as I thought like the sobriety and the kicking out of all the vices and everything would be, would be tough, um, it really hasn't been that bad. Um, I've kind of leaned on setting my intentions and, and going through everything like that. Um, I talked to the listeners a little bit yesterday. I had a, a Thanksgiving gathering. So not having carbs and sugar on Thanksgiving was like this whole thing as I'm, as I'm driving to Thanksgiving, I'm like, how am I going to handle this? I'm trying to like plan it out before I get there. Um, and I think I had, I had like one tiny little piece of dessert that I'd made, you know, made my piece with. I'm like, I'm going to do just that little bit. And so I still feel like that's pretty good sticking to controlling my impulses, you know. So doing well so far, body's feeling good. Um, I'm down to, last time I checked, which was a week ago, I'm down to 209 um, on the scale. So coming down from about 250 is, is pretty stellar over, oh, not just this month, that's over like six okay. months. Wow. So yeah, since, that's since you and I met and when I was, when I was hanging out with you uh, that week, I was at about 250 then. So wow. between that's now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely just saw a shift with you throughout that week as we were hanging out. You got more energy and and, oh, yeah. and just watching that shift and seeing the momentum carry forward has been, been amazing to see the things you're doing. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a long road and I just keep plugging away every day. And I kind of, that was kind of the point of this was that like, I'd been doing that probably six months or however long I'd been since then I'd been slowly making incremental changes. And then I was like, okay, I got all these little things that are still holding me back. Let's just tackle them all at once and get them the hell out of the way. <laughs> yeah, It's awesome. It's, it's super inspiring. Right. And, and I saw you post, initially on Facebook that you were doing this. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of stuff to give up. That's bold. Yeah. Um, but, but knowing what you know about the mind and um, controlling the impulses, I, I definitely knew you could do it. And, and seeing you have this success has been really cool. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, it was a thing. And in, in an episode zero on here, I said, hey, this is what I'm doing. I don't recommend that everybody start out this way. Like if you want to, and you're a strong mind, and you want to you wanna jump in and do something crazy like that, go ahead. But you know, if it's just if it's just what you're doing, you're just starting this process, pick one or two things, take them out slowly and start your change that way. Um, but um, yeah, so, so the cessation of that's been going well. Um, it's been really cool getting more into spiritual connectiveness. Um, I'm taking Reiki with Sandra uh, right now. So learning a lot there. And from, you know, again, eight months ago before that, that week that we had, I thought, Reiki was total bullshit. Honestly, I didn't know anything about yeah. it. So that was kind of an unfair judgment. But now as I get into learning it, and I see how much of it aligns with exactly who I am and what I'm doing, like, I just get my mind blown, you know, every couple. Yes. Yeah, so, so today we can talk about some of the principles that underlie Reiki. And we don't have to get into like, the, the practice of Reiki, because I think just psychology and understanding ourselves and our emotions is, is a huge part of what Reiki is and it's a huge part of what psychology is. So there's so much overlap um, and that affects our decision making as well, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's so interesting, the Reiki principles that fall into like some of the things that I've noticed I need to work on are like, uh, you know, like last time we spoke was the, um, was the communication and the emotions, you know, and those are two of the chakras that align with each other and try to keep each other in balance. And it was interesting that that was kind of my convergent issue. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. So the, the cool thing, like how I always frame it because Reiki seems kind of out there for a lot of people, especially in the Western world, you know, I was raised Catholic. So the idea of this energy stuff was kind of weird. Uh, but the idea is that when you focus on something and you give it meaning, you have an emotional response. And that emotional response drops hormones in, into your energy centers into different areas of your body. And that, uh, those, that hormonal response then leaves a residue. So like if you have stress, you drop cortisol, and that cortisol then burns through your system and it leaves a residue and it affects the energy flow through that center. Does that make sense? So hmm. when we have these fear-based emotions, we're, we're constantly dropping stress, worry, adrenaline, cortisol, 
uh, all these different chemicals into our system that then throws off our energy centers. And when you frame it that way, it kind of makes sense, right? Because have you ever gotten a text that said, we need to talk? And instantly, instantly you drop that like stress hormone and, and your whole body changes. You can feel it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good way to frame that. That's exactly why that's exactly why I brought you around because I've been, you know, it being just stepping into it myself and then talking to my audience about it, trying to not dive so deep into, you know, what sometimes is like, uh, you know, the hippy dippy or voodoo kind of yeah. piece of it, but to be able to actually explain it to the average person who has their traditional Western belief structures. Yeah. And so, so the impulse comes from, we have two, really two parts of our brain that matter for this that I teach about um, our neocortex where our conscious decisions are made. And then our subconscious mind, which is in our limbic system, our lizard brain and our subconscious is programmed uh, through extreme emotional events. So I tell this story this summer I was camping and I had a bear circle my campsite. Oh, geez. And, and you go into that fight or flight survival mode, right? And when you go into that, you drop into your limbic system because it's programmed to keep you alive. It doesn't want you to override it with conscious decisions. It wants to kick in the evolutionary program. So you can't learn. You can't make other decisions. When you're in fear, you have that automatic response. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so most of us that have impulse control issues or used to have them, when we go into stress, we drop into our limbic system and our programming that's automatic. So we, we can't override it with conscious decisions because we're in fear or in stress and our limbic system just automatically responds to our situation. And so most of us have programs around food and alcohol and, and drugs in our limbic system. And in some way we think they're, they're positive, they meet our needs and they take us away from pain. So when we go into stress, our limbic system just craves them. It gives us these cravings. Hmm. So when we, if we can live in those love-based emotions and be totally present, you never have that impulse. Even if that program's in there, you can, you can override it. But because you can't always, you know, we're, we're human, we're not, you know, these saints or spiritual beings, sometimes we go into these fear-based emotions and that's when those impulses come up. Huh, interesting. That's kind of interesting because over the last couple of days, um, I've been kind of, so you know, I'm on day 18 now. I'm kind of on technically the downward slide and like, Yesterday, I was uh, uh, rolling through the grocery store, and like it's cold outside. I was looking at some stouts. Like I was just eyeballing some stouts. Like, hey, girl, how you doing? You know, <laughs> like these big fancy, you know, wintertime beers. And I'm like, yeah, I got, I got like a list of beers in my head, you know, for like December first. And I'm trying to combat or kind of trying to plan on how I'm gonna move back into allowing myself to not be absolutely um, a- absolutely zero uh, vices like I am now, you know, because I like a good beer now and then I don't have to get hammered. Um, sure. You know, I-, I like smoking a joint now and then just sort of a little relaxation. I actually feel like on some level there might be, um, there might be a little bit of, of um, connection assistance there I had a conversation uh with one of our with uh Dr. Manny one time about how like maybe the drop in inhibitions actually allows you to spiritually connect a little bit easier and I know you and I have had conversations about um you know like psychedelics and things like that how that could be possible and that can be powerful so I'm not sure that I'm gonna go back to 100% cessation for like the rest of my life yeah that then has started to deliver some of that fear-based emotion in me and try to plan and what am I going to, am I going to make rules or how am I going to handle that going forward? Because looking forward in December, I see immediately um, three events where I could do some heavy partying. You know, my buddy's birthday is the weekend before mine. My birthday is on the 17th. And then you got New Year's Eve, all typical times where I would see myself, you know, imbibing in, you know, a little bit of an accelerated fashion. So, you know, kind of been in that fear space a little bit about how I'm going to handle that. Yeah. So I think the key is that you're, you're coming into a place where you're going to consciously decide, Hey, Mm. I I want to have a beer just because I like beer and I want to smoke a joint just because I want to smoke a joint. It's not going to be, I get home, I'm stressed out. I don't want one, but these cravings come up and I can't fight it and I'm resisting it. Right. The impulse control is not, not ever doing anything, but it's having control, making conscious decisions. And just saying, like, I'm just going to have one because I like it, or I'm going to have a couple, or, or, you know, making a decision ahead of time, maybe in your case is the best. And just saying, look, I'm going to have three beers, 
I'm gonna get a little buzz and I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna be good with that. Yeah. And, um, and again, when you, when you live in fear, you don't have that control. So, you know, through Reiki constantly managing your state, your energy, your emotions, your focus can put you into that conscious, present, loving state where you can have a beer and just enjoy it and not judge yourself for it. Right. Cause my, my buddy, Chris, who he actually just did hypnosis training with us last week. He has this thing called a double fuck. So a lot of times, a lot of times we, we do something that's not right. Right. And we're, we fuck ourselves that way. And then what happens afterwards to create the double fuck is we judge ourselves for doing it. Oh yeah. Not only have you had a beer, now you're judging yourself for having a beer and you're fucking yourself both ways. You know what I mean? Instead of just saying, Hey, it is what it is. And letting that judgment pass. Cause you know, through hypnosis, you can't help someone when you're judging them, right? You can't help a client when you're judging them. You can't yeah. help yourself when you're judging yourself either. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I like that. That makes perfect sense because that's exactly, you know, that's exactly how I, up until now, uh, have spent a lot of my headspace is, you know, going up until the event, like, I don't really want to act this way, but, you know, fuck it, I'm going to. Um, and then afterwards, uh, feeling like shit about it, because, you know, back to judging myself. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. And again, remember, you get what you focus on, right? Where focus goes, energy flows. So the more you're like, fuck, I shouldn't have had a drink. I shouldn't have had this drink. I'm like a bad person the more you're going to get it. Cause that's what you're focused on. Instead of just being like, all right, I had a drink. I'm not going to judge it. I'm gonna let it go. And I'm going to focus on the forward, go, you know, going forward what I want. So yeah. that judgment just hangs around and reinforces the energy around that habit. Which is, which I really like that. And that's interesting. And I've been able to move into that headspace through the experiment. Um, because on, on day two of the experiment, um, I actually screwed up. I had a really emotional evening. Um, my, place where I go and meet all of my friends and, you know, do my dancing. And it's been, uh, it's a bar that's been open for 23 years, a music venue. And it's just where I've met, like, seriously, one of those places when you're in, you can just kind of stand up and look around in a circle and I can see like 20 people that I consider friends and that I can get love and connection from. Yeah. And that place closed. And the night that that place closed, um, I was, it's called, it was called upstairs lounge. It was upstairs and I was walking down the stairs and I knew that that was like the last time that I would ever walk down those stairs. And I started to, to get emotional. I started to cry. It was a painful moment. And it was at that moment that I decided that I needed some kind of other relief. And I went home and smoked a joint, which all in all is not the worst of my vices and not the biggest deal. Sure. But at that time, you know, I struggled with that decision. Um, and then the next morning I woke up and I've even covered that on the, on the podcast being, you know, absolutely honest with people or else what's the point. But like, yeah, te technically if this was a win loss thing, I've lost, it's over, I'm done. But does that mean that I'm going to stop the podcast, stop the experiment, stop the spiritual growth and any of that? Absolutely not. I accepted it for what it was and moved on and it wasn't, wasn't a thing. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Perfection is the enemy of progress, right? When we try to be perfect, we, we wait to take action. We judge ourselves, you know, all these things happen and just accepting you're human and that decision is what it is. And now how can we get better going forward? Um, but yeah, and, and you're so self-aware that that emotional situation caused that impulsive decision, right? And now you can see what triggers you, what your anchors are. And then, you know, if you're working on self-hypnosis, you can kind of pull and change those triggers and anchors to change those decisions. Yeah. Well, and that was, and that was the thing is at that time, I, as I was driving home, it was like a 25 minute drive home from the bar. Um, and I had done really well. I even had a buddy that came up to me and he, he said hi and gave me a hug and he looked at me and he goes, dude, you are not fucked up enough to be here. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm sober all month. And he just kind of looked at me like, Oh, okay. And, um, it's a really, I have a really great, um, group of friends because most of them have been really supportive and most of them understand that even though we all like to party and do our thing, sure. sometimes you need to take that step back. Sure. Um, you know, I've always said about drugs and alcohol, like they don't, I, I don't live in that space where I believe that they're as bad as most of society does, but I do always say they'll get you, you know, you, they can, they can, they can just get you. They can jump up and grab you by the boo-boo and put you in a spot where you don't, you know, really want to be. And I was getting kind of close to that spot. So it was time to pump the brakes and take it back. And um, that evening as well, I realized on that lengthy drive home that I had, I had a toolkit other than smoking this joint that I could use. Yes. However, I consciously chose 
to go to the old crux. And, you know, it was on day two, had that happened today. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure which, which direction I would go in that moment. I would like to think that I would lean more on, you know, some chakra clearings of hypnosis or something else to relax like that. But um, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that in those moments when I get, and, it, and it's not even in the, in the extreme moments, it's just been such a part of my life for so long that I'm just like, man, I'd really like to smoke a joint right now. <laughs> so as I, I, for me anyway, and probably you'll notice this as well, is that as you begin to grow uh, spiritually, emotionally, and, and start to learn things about yourself and the universe and God and whatever, whatever your truth is, you just are less attracted. Like I used to love to love to drink and party. And, and as I got healthier and healthier, I just craved it less. And like through the years, it's been less. And uh, then it was three or four days a year, I just get hammered and party all day long. And now it's even those days, I don't, I just don't crave it. And I can have a drink and not want another one, you know, and, and maybe for you, you'll find yourself slowly feeling better without them. Well, and, and through the month, I, I really do. I do feel better. It's nice to, you know, it's, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, I'm, I'm usually have only been asleep for uh, up until now in the past, I usually only been asleep for two or three hours at this point, wow. you know, like I, I was kind of into it for a little while. And, and so like, it's really nice to be up awake. I've had some, uh, some decaf Earl Grey tea. I've been doing some car shopping online. I'm here with you, like diving into some real work. So like that is in and of itself a huge reward. Um, and I feel really good about that. Uh, I have had, I, I really, I've been really interested in the side effects of the experiment. So the experiment has its, its parameters, you know, no drinking, no drugs, no uh, carbs, no sugar, um, no porn, no masturbation, uh, the, the positive um, affirmations and Reiki clearings and self-hypnosis and all that stuff is kind of like the strict parameters of the experiment. It's a lot, yeah. However, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it, it is a lot and it keeps me going. And then, but then there's the side effect of all that, of like all of that put together. So I don't have any of that. So now I am more productive. Mm -hmm. I am more into um, my surroundings. I'm paying more attention to the people in my life. And I'm working on one thing that everybody that's been listening knows is that my big struggle through this, I have two big struggles through this. One is caffeine because that mid afternoon lull is just, making me tired. Um, and the other is just my relationship with my wife. We have discovered that we have a lot of work to do and that we were piling on kind of some cover-ups, you know, yeah. with all the inebriation and stuff like that. And we were using that to get our connection. And so there has been some, some difficulty there, but all, all of those are like side effects of the actual parameters, you know? And, and I really think that that was the point and that's kind of the awesomeness. And I feel like I'm now at a point where, when I've been standing in the own way of my career, like I've kind of stepped out of the way a little bit and moving into my best self, which is pretty awesome to feel. Yeah. I, I used to notice when I was drinking, you know, on the weekends, it would take you till Wednesday to feel like normal. Yep. And then you have, you have Thursday to, to produce and get caught up. And then Friday you're back at it again. And you like, it's impossible to move forward in life when you do that. That's how I felt anyway. Um, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you're not only drinking, but, you know, staying up till five, six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, and, you know, that, that again is one of my struggles uh, with this is I'm, I'm a big love and connection guy. You know, that's one of my big needs. And I, those were intertwined, you know, my whole circle, which is full of amazing people. But, and again, I, I don't, you know, usage is not something that I deem to make you a bad person. Right. You can get in the way of things sometimes. It doesn't have to. Um, but I'm trying to get to this point where I can go back out and be in those situations. You know, I, I don't, I know that like the traditional and, and I haven't really considered myself identified as an addict, but I know like the traditional 12 step program, you know, in the traditional addict behavior is like complete cessation, get away from all of it. Yeah. But those people are important to me. That music is important to me. Those situations are important to me still. So going out and being in those situations and being able to control myself is a goal that I am kind of like trying to get to and trying to get to and trying to get to. Um, and I feel really confident about it. I don't feel like I'm not going to be able to handle myself sure. once I'm in that situation. So Joel, you know, when we do uh, hypnosis, oftentimes we tell someone to try to do something. And what, nah. what, 
What happens when we use the word try? You fail. They fail. They all get you out. So trying impl- implies failure. So just do it. Just figure out the way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. So luckily there's a big event on um, Wednesday before, before Thanksgiving that I'm probably going to, that I'm probably going to go out to. And uh, you know, that's one of the biggest party days of the year, the night before Thanksgiving, right. traditionally everybody goes home and sees all their friends and all that stuff. So it should be a pretty hefty night for some people. Um, and I have no, I have no problem that I'll be able to go out and enjoy that environment in a sober way. So a lot of that is because I used to go out and not want to drink and everyone gives you shit about it and like peer pressure and you're like, and they get, people get annoying and aggressive, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, they, like you're, like you're insulting their way of life. Yeah. Like, oh, you're too good to drink. Like you're too good to have a beer. And I'm like, no, I just don't want one. And now like the way I carry myself, um, I'm so confident and congruent with the not with like, if I want to drink, I'll have a drink. Like you giving me shit about it, it's not going to change me at all. Right. Like, people don't even like, now they're like, wow, like that's why you're so in shape or that's why you're doing all these things and traveling. And, and now they like look at me totally differently because I look at myself differently. Right. And I'm like proud of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I don't need a drink. I have no, um, I don't need their approval. And so when you, when you come from that place, that, that's a result of that inner work that you're doing, you can just be you and people will accept it and, and not yeah. give you that pressure. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like it's more, um, it, in that environment, it would be more internal than external pressure. One of the beautiful things of doing this the way I'm doing in this, this podcast, and I think I'm doing good work. I want people to listen. And I have a lot of in, in my community, um, you know, it may be a subtle underlying side effect that people don't realize why these two things are, are together, but you have a lot of anxiety and you have a lot of stress and, you know, we go out in the evening and we party and we dance to relieve that stress, um, you know, as opposed to releasing our stress. We, you know, I've done an episode on that where we relieve and we just kind of put some shit on top of it, you know, some weed, some booze, we put that on top of it and it's still there. And so pushing this into my community and, and that everybody kind of, everybody sees now, I mean, I've been posting an episode a day and, and through Facebook and that kind of stuff. I'm really shoving it out there in the community so people see what I'm doing and almost one of, there's a little bit of self-service in there because when somebody reaches out to me, I finally had uh, last Thursday, I had my first, I think I'd released episode like eight or nine. And finally somebody sent me a message and said like, Hey, your message on intent really resonated with me. Can you help me set some intent to make some change in my life? And I like, I just exploded with gratitude and joy and almost welled up into tears because that's the whole point is to try and help people. And so like, there's almost a little bit of self-service in there is because I'm expecting the opposite in my material. Instead of people shoving drinks on me to go out and, you know, give me some praise, give me some love, you know? Yeah. And, um, I, sometimes I still need that validation in myself sometimes, you know? So, so maybe this will be a better way to meet your need for love and connection than the, than the substances, right? Yeah. And, and the other thing that comes to mind is you talk about relieving stress and going out and drinking oftentimes, well, all the time, like I talked about the residue from those fear-based hormones, the, the chemical residue from drugs and alcohol often leaves you more depressed, more anxious, more stressed mm-hmm. after they wear off. Right. And, and that's what a hangover is. And like when I, if I had a couple drinks, the way I view the world changes completely, like from gratitude, presence, all these things, like I go into fear, worry, doubt, lack. And I, I can like see those changes in my psychology so clearly because I'm tapping into different thought patterns. And so I can drink alcohol, become present in the moment, let those inhibitions go. And when it wears off, it's even worse than it was before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And the other thing is like from, from the spiritual point of view, like my, not my person to person connection, you know, I feel like that there, there is some elements of inebriation that allow that person to person immediate connection to expand you know, loss of inhibitions and and talking about things that are a little closer to your heart or something like that. But my connection to the universe, just, I mean, you might as well just chop that line with an ax, you know, and I just feel so disconnected from my true purpose and my point at that time um, that it just, that's where that, and that's where those fear-based emotions and that kind of just emptiness when you get back home and you're alone comes back. 
So alcohol or spirits are often used to denature things. So they pull, they use alcohol in the processing of essential oils to pull the essential part out of them. And so, you know, when we drink, oftentimes the essential part of our cells are our soul that's connected to us begins to separate. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. It's a good little analogy there. So I don't know if it's true or if it's just a metaphor, you know, but it's, uh, but it, it feels right. It makes sense. Doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we're hypnotists. We kind of live in metaphor. So that's, I'll take it. That's right. <laughs> deeper and deeper. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, again, I think it comes back to if you live in love and gratitude and presence, those, those substances resonate with you less. And um, when you're in fear and anxiety, Oftentimes we have programs that those substances can take us out of that, even if it's only temporary. Um, and, and like you said, we're, we have programs that link love and connection to drinking. Like, like how many times we've got to drink and everyone's loving and connecting when they're drinking. And so they, their subconscious limbic system makes that connection. Mm -hmm. And now when they want to connect, it's like, hey, drink some alcohol, even if they're alone. And they, they feel like they get that connection. Yeah. So understanding the programs in the subconscious. And if you want to change them, obviously uh, working with a guy like you or myself, um, to start changing those programs. I hadn't even thought of that as well before. This is why it's so awesome to have somebody else on the podcast besides living in my own brain is because I haven't even thought that you create almost like when we're trying to relieve stress and we'll create an anchor, you know, like, like we've done like a little motion or something to anchor this feeling to yourself. Totally. Haven't even thought about that. That I mean, of course, like with with upstairs, my the place, you know, like there's there's love and happiness anchored in that building. Yeah. Um, but then like haven't even thought about that, that emotional anchor to the process of actually drinking before you even get to the inebriation. That is another really cool point. That's really interesting on how you can just have that so set in that that's just subconsciously deep that you feel that, like you said, when you're alone. Yeah. So even, so that's the thing, our limbic system, our subconscious is responsible for 95% of our actions. So, you know, it's natural that if, if you're stressed or worried and it, it wants to make that connection, even if your conscious mind is like, Hey, I don't want to smoke. I don't want to drink. Right. You have that in your conscious mind. That's your goal. But if your subconscious isn't congruent with that, a lot of times it'll still give you those urges that people struggle to override. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. I like that. Oh, cool. Um, so what, what else? So like when, you know, I know that I've been leaning on, on the shocker clearings mostly, um, yes. because, because of, of the Reiki and I'm trying to get into that. And, um, but what do, do you have any special tools or things that you recommend to people when they feel themselves going into, um, you know, going into that fear base where they would usually reach for that, um, that vice, you know, I, I do um, my eight minute chill, a little quick um, self hypnosis audio uh, that I give out to people. Do you have anything else that I'm maybe not familiar with or any exercises or things that you like to put in there in that space? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much all I study and teach and do is, is changing those emotional anchors and the, and the state we live in. Because I, I teach often that, you know, the thought patterns you tap into, the energy that you're living in affects the thought patterns you tap into, which affect, which affect your emotions and your impulses. So first of all, moving your body, your physiology and your breath is so huge. And so if you can work out, do breath work, dance, and just raise your energy that way, you can tap into different thought patterns. Um, meditation slash hypnosis definitely is a way. And then really long term, it's changing the subconscious programs through hypnosis. Right, because then you can totally you can eliminate you can weaken that impulse altogether. Um, but otherwise, you're just gonna you're gonna fight it with your willpower, and that's a that's kind of a losing battle if you don't get into the root of um, of the substance of what the substance means in your limbic system in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Which is probably something I need to do a little. I'm probably discovering I need to do a little bit more work on because here at the moment. I am looking forward to that finish line. You know, I, I, Joe Rogan's podcast is one of the things that inspired me. He does Sober October. Again, I really like October. I like Halloween. So I'm like, I, I'm going to get, I'm going to get messed up on Halloween. So um, let's do it in November. And I, of course, you know, so I'm a month behind. So I, the last episode I listened to was him and his friends wrapping up their Sober October and doing an episode talking about it. And essentially they just got hammered. 
and they're just on this podcast, just acting all goofy, getting all hammered and stuff. Yeah. And my response to that is like, Oh, I wish that I could have my last episode of my podcast be getting hammered with some of my buddies. And like, but that is totally the opposite of the point of the podcast. Right. You know, there may be, I mean, I do have a plan to celebrate my finish line by revisiting some of these items I've given up, sure. but more in a, you know, more in a controlled manner. Like I'm picking like a high quality cocktail and a high quality beer. So I'll have like a cocktail and a beer instead of going out and drinking whiskey and water and just getting hammered. Yeah. So I, I wrestled my whole life. And when you cut weight for a season or a week or whatever it is, you get done and you like just want to eat and you eat till you can't eat anymore until you can't breathe. And, um, and, and for you, I, I think you're going to have some different strategies than I had back then and different understandings of yourself that are going to allow you to just say, Hey, I'm just going to have a beer instead of doing that binge and throwing out all your progress. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think for like, I've been thinking about, um, setting rules actually yeah. you know yeah. like uh, i still you know i still enjoy the carbs and a good cheeseburger and french fries and some shitty food now and then but like so like if i set that as and i can do that you know once a week sure. or something like that then that is going to go forward in there if i set like i can still have a party day like once a month and allow that you know, again, like we talked about earlier, allow myself to accept that and to be cool with that and to just have that one day and have the next day be my hangover day and move on with the rest of my life from there yeah. and just accept that and be cool. I think that's probably going to be how I face that progress going forward. I like so. it. I like it. Well, good, man. I'm, I'm inspired by all your work. It's, uh, it's cool to see you taking steps forward. You know, our human experience is really about progress and, uh, and seeing you progress is exciting. Well, I appreciate that, man. And you've always been a huge support. And um, I always love every time I try to talk to you, you don't let me get out a, a negative thought. You're the constant reframer. And I appreciate that. Um, hey, man, where can my folks find some more about you? So they can find me on YouTube. Just type in Nicholas Spohn and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Spohn Trained, like athletic training, Spohn Trained. Um, and then Instagram is the same thing, Spohn Trained, hashtag Spohn Trained. So that's where awesome. you can find me. Yeah. Awesome. Look Nick up. He's super inspirational. He's an awesome dude. Um, I really enjoy your friendship, man. I'm super glad that we met. Uh, so thanks for hanging out with me today. I appreciate you. Honored to be, honored to be your first guest. I'm excited to, uh, to see where this goes. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And as we always say, make every day better than the day before. And if you fail, that's perfectly fine because that means tomorrow is going to be easy. Live with gratitude and celebrate your victories. Have a good day, everybody.